So my name is Declan Healy. I'm the project manager for the Lower Harbour project on behalf of RV and Irish Water. And in true project manager style, I'm going to waffle for five or 10 minutes at the start. And as soon as the serious works begin, I will disappear. So look, I'm going to give a quick introduction and overview of the job, and then I'll hand over to Paul Griffin, who's going to show some detail of the estuary crossing, which was work we did last year. And then Nicholas O'Dwyer, Martin Hickey and Philem O'Neill will talk about some of the specific challenges we encountered in Cove. We've presented to the Institute on two previous occasions. 2016, we were in Clyde Road and we talked about Shen Valley Treatment Plant. And in 2018, we were in the Rochester Park Hotel and we talked about the Southside Works. So tonight we're going to uh, give some detail on the last piece of the jigsaw. Um, I suppose by way of an introduction, I, I just want to say that the, uh, the job was a significant achievement for Irish Water. The um, seven years in the making, um, approximately 150 million in total, of which Irish Water spent 144 million of taxpayers' money, delivered on time, within budget, with a first class safety record. Um, and I suppose I, I would just mention the fact that it's taken us seven years to get to that, that slide. And we got there with the help of a, a lot of people. And you'll see the logos of the contracting entities that we engaged with during the, the project. And there was a lot of subcontractors also involved, but we worked very closely with Cork County Council. Nicholas O'Dwyer, our consultant engineers, took us on the journey from 2014 to where we are today. We were with them all the way. And then we had various entities helping out, helping us out at each of the individual uh, phases. So I guess, look, as a project manager, um, uh, I spent spent a lot of my time talking about uh, uh, time and program and finances and money and costs. But in simple terms, time is money and, and money is a, an imaginary concept. So, and all that really matters is safety. And, and I, if I was to make one point or observation or ask you to take something home from tonight, it is the fact that we give safety in Irish water uh, a level of focus that is an order of magnitude greater than anything else. And I have a couple of pictures there of, of two Warden Burke lads down the trench. I suppose we, we, we built 30 kilometres of, of deep sewers on busy roads. Uh, and the picture on the right is the team that, that sunk the, the largest box casing in Monkstown. And our job is to keep these guys safe and all of the pedestrians and all of the, the traffic and everybody that's in the vicinity of the works. Um, and we had an exemplary safety record. Our lost time frequency rate for the job is 0 0.52. That means we had an accident or an incident for once every 200,000 working hours. We had three injuries on the job. One of the lads on the treatment plant had to get two stitches on his thumb. Um, one of the men in, in the trench in, on the south side tripped over a toolbox and bumped his head. He was a bit sore for a day or two. And in Cove, one of the uh, crew tripped while coming out of the loo and went over on his ankle. Um, and they were the three injuries that we sustained on the job and we worked 765,000 man hours on site. So um, we're, we're delighted with the safety. We spent a lot of time and effort on it. And one of the things we emphasized during the works was the fact that we knew the lads, particularly the likes of, of, of Warden Burke, they're down from Galway, they're living out of a bag, they're working long hours, they're away from home. It's difficult, it's challenging. And we put a lot of emphasis on med mental health and looking after people. Uh, we discovered that statistically, if you're a, a, a man, a middle-aged man in Ireland, and you work in construction or in production, you're 14 times, approximately 14 times more likely to take your own life than to be killed while at work. And that's, that's pretty profound when you think about it. So um, we, we, we work closely with, with all our crews um, and everybody to ensure we all got home safe. Thanks, Paul. Just to outline the, the need for the scheme, 40,000 wheelie bins of raw sewage going into the harbour every day since time memorial. No, obviously it wasn't 40,000 at the start, but it's grown and grown over the years to an extent that 
Cork Lower Harbour was the largest offending agglomeration in Europe and the European courts had taken Ireland Inc to court for being in breach of the Urban Wastewater Directive. Uh, we were, Ireland was found guilty and all that was left to do was to define the fines um, and typically the fines are of the order of 50 to 100 million up front and then something between 100,000 and a half a million per day for every day that you continue to uh, offend. So our backs was to the wall when we started this job because the European courts wanted to, to hit us with fines. And this slide here just shows where those 40,000 wheelie bins of sewage are coming out. You'll see a lot of them in Cove. And while you were waiting at the two minutes at the start, you might have seen a guy jumping off a bridge. I think he was jumping off somewhere between 21 and 22. And it's not uncommon for people uh, to go swimming in Passage and Monkstown. But the harbour is, is just so big and there's such a volume of water there that it, it had the ability to, to maybe take the raw sewage without it stinking to high heaven all day, every day. But certainly the water quality was poor and we were under significant pressure to sort it out, which meant we had to dig up all the main roads in the harbour. Um, I know there's a lot of engineers on the, on the call tonight, so I thought I'd, I'd throw some numbers up there. I'm not going to go through all of these numbers. But certainly, if you have a look at them, you might find that there's something that catches your eye and you might want to ask a question later. I'll mention the 40,000 wheelie bins again because it was a number that we, we came up with to, to try and quantify the, the volume of, of wastewater that was going in every day. And we wanted to put it in, a, in, a, in, in terms that, you know, a non-engineer, just your average show would understand, well, 40,000 wheelie bins, that's a lot of wastewater. Um, I've seen that number on... The Irish Times, I've heard it on Radio 1 and Radio 2 and Red FM and 96 FM. I've heard it mentioned in the doll. Um, that number stuck. It proved to be a very useful number for us. Um, and the other, the other two points I would make here is 18,000 car journeys per day on the affected roads. Very busy roads, main roads, and we're, we had to dig them all up, basically. Um, and we were doing that in 2000, from 2015 on. And our name was Irish Water. So we were public enemy number one before we even started. Um, so we went around. We had a 88 public information events and we told people we were coming. We told them we were going to delay them. We told them there was going to be disruption. We told them there was going to be a nuisance. And we worked with them. We listened to them when we incorporated the local knowledge in the terms and conditions of the various contracts. Uh, look, I won't go through all of these because I haven't got the time. Um, so I just wanted to... Um, give you a quick overview of what we've done and where we've come from. So we started in 2014, 15, 16, building the wastewater treatment plant in Shan Valley with CISCs and EPS. And in the space of 18 months, we went from a greenfield site to uh, a, a, treat, a plant treating 65,000 P or capability thereof. We then built the network between Carrigaline and, and Crosshaven. We did some refurbishments and refurbished the pumping stations and similarly, we had Wardenburg do that work and the work for Monkstown and Passage, which meant by the end of 2018, we were treating 30 of the 40,000 wheelie bins. The treatment plant gave us 20,000 in 16. It gives a breathing space with Europe where we were able to demonstrate, lads, we're, we're doing this and we'll get it done. Um, so the last leg of the journey was to get across from Monkstown to Cove. Paul's going to give a bit more detail on that, as is Martin. And then finally, we, we built Cove and connected it at the end of the summer in August. So all of this is now in place, up and running, operational. We recently handed it over. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul. He's going to provide a, 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 a snapshot of the estuary crossing. And Martin will then come in and talk about background to the crossing. And Phylum will talk about Cove. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks for that, Daglon. Um, just before I start, uh, just to remind you, we did do a more in-depth version of the Estuary Crossing um, presentation back in January. I think it's still available on the Engineers Ireland YouTube channel. So it, it, this is just a whistle-stop tour kind of a reminder of, of what we did for those who attended at the time. Um, so this is just a, a profile of where the Estuary Crossing is. Um, it's basically collecting the connecting the northern networks of Cove um, over to the southern south side, picking it up in Monkstown Park. Is there the uh, gravity because discharge chamber there and the gravity sewer, 
and it's, it's into the kind of the main networks that uh, Deglon spoke of previously there. So um, just I think the note here as well is that we're working in a very kind of uh, built up urban environment here, on, particularly on the Monkstown side, not so much in the dockyard. Um, where we have a reception site there in Monkstown. So there's schools, sports ground, uh, there's children's playground, a church, you name it, it's it's there kind of right next to us. Um, we're drilling under private grounds next to the harbour. So we'd very strict kind of limits on the noise, dust, vibration. We had a lot of monitors up around the place as well. Um, uh, we, we also had to do a lot of kind of pre and post condition surveys of anything deemed to be within the zone of influence of the drilling here on site. So um, it was essential really that we, we had kind of buy in from the community in the area. So we, we spent a lot of time talking to the people, getting to know the residents here, letting them know what kind of impact they can expect. Um, and you know where possible kind of helping them out to kind of mitigate any impacts whether it's the late working getting the pipe installed anything like that or noise that we listened to them we worked with them they had a direct kind of channel to us um it, it's essential for a successful project like this just to get get the kind of um the community on board and working with you and it, it definitely paid dividends in this project as well um so it just um that that's just a brief snapshot of where the drill is kind of going under the harbour just to give you an idea so starting with the drilling over in cork dockyard working with the monkstown park and um, this is also an nec type of contract so it was the, it was the first um nec type contract used in irish water actually so there was a, a bit a bit of um pressure and kind of oversight on this one um but happy to say it was kind of a successful use of the contract as well it's the the market preference for this type of project would be an NEC type contract where the the scope isn't fully de defined. Um, we we know roughly where the where the drill lines are going, but you know you can only do so much SI with the ground, particularly under the harbour, and you you have to use your best kind of uh, educated guess of what's below the harbour as well when we're drilling through it. So hence we use the NEC option. It's also you know it's it's a risk sharing contract. It's open book as well. Everyone's working together. There, there's nothing to hide. So a bit of adjustment to your traditional contract, but um, definitely worked well on this particular one. Um, just just a recap on what uh, kind of directional drilling is. So initially we drilled a pilot hole kind of from the Cork dockyard coming up to Monkstown with um, a small kind of 12, 12 inch uh, drilling tool. I call it small now, but it's, it's still a kilometer long of drilling rods with a, a kind of downhole assembly at the front of it that drills the pilot. It took a number of weeks to get from uh, Cork Dockyard over to Monkstown. Uh, all the while, while you're drilling in this bore, you're pumping in the bentonite, which is the mud water mix as well, to kind of uh, lubricate the drilling heads, take the fines out of the bore, bring it back to where you're drilling from, recycle the material, use the bentonite again, and take out kind of all the cuttings as well. Once you have the pilot in, uh, it's kind of supposed for us that marked the first pilot was the success of the project because we know now that we can drill successfully all the way through. It was, it was always a big risk for the project. After the, that, we uh, did a couple of successive passes, three sweeps in, um, in total, increasing the diameter of the bore with each sweep. Um, so there was an 18 inch, uh, 23 inch and 28 inch pass to get up to roughly 730 mil of uh, diameter of the bore. You know, the, pipe itself is only 500 mil but you, you need that extra um, kind of wiggle room really to, to bring a kilometer long of pipe through this bore from one side to the other to, in a continuous pull um so uh, the, there's two key roles really in this in the drilling operations um that you want the experience for and that's the drill operator and that's the mud technician so the, the drill operator who, who's, who's actually controlling the drilling monitoring the pressure down the hole of the bentonite and also with, with the steering technician keep an eye on where the actual drill is in real time but um the mud technician he's monitoring what's coming out of the hole basically to see to see what consistency of bentonite you're getting returned what size of the um, cuttings you're getting whether you're getting a mix of too much water or too much bentonite it, it, that can also um show evidence of potential frack out or air issues with the bore so you really need someone experienced who's keeping an eye on that and can, can call out problems this is an overview of where the actual lines went to so we on the left you have the cork dockyard that's the launch site over on the right you have the um the monkstown playground area which we just looked at in the previous slide 
So the deepest point of the drill is actually the two um, semicircles there marked in red. That's under the key wall in the dockyard. So it was, it was a bit of an unknown, the full length of, or full depth of that key wall. Their old um, piles could have been done sometimes in the 50s or 60s. We're not quite sure. The data on it is a bit um, dated at best, I can hand drawn sketches. So we picked that as the deepest point. Uh, that was roughly 57 meters below ground. So we had to get down very quickly into the hard rock. And then it's after that, it's, it's a case of coming up gradually under the harbour and you're, you're steering it kind of in one direction at a time so that by the time we get to Monkstown we pretty much have a straight shot up into Monkstown Park. <clears throat> um, this is the actual drilling rig itself so the three parts here they, they make the downhole assembly. You've got your, your tungsten carbide drill bit at the front the second is that's your drive shaft that's a positive displacement motor that's what that's where the bentonite has been pumped through and that's what's powering the drill. Um, there's also what you don't see from the picture is there's actually a slight kink in that by design and that uh, is to allow you to steer the, the drilling assembly itself um, other than that if you didn't have the kink you'd, you'd only be drilling in a straight line and behind that is the steering tool which is a gyroscopic steering tool connected by data cable all the way up through each of the rods so you have 108 rods in total um, to give roughly a kilometre of steel pipe that's going in for the pilot and a data cable running through um, that's that, that, that's kind of telling you where it, it's telling you where number three is at all times so at all times the operator has a, a clear indication of where the steering tool is in the ground not so much the drilling head itself so you need the experience to know um, if you're going slightly offline so so that that's again that's where the experienced operator comes in um, that there's a there's a mixture of rock below the harbour, but mostly it is solid rock. It's sandstone being the kind of toughest one there. So that's why we chose the tungsten carbide bit to get through that hard rock. Now the first 70 meters or so of the drill that's was made up ground, which we had to use a casing, which wasn't ideal. Um, kind of soft ground, it doesn't really hold up uh, too well on its own. But the rest of it, you know, you could you couldn't ask for a better um, kind of formation really, because it, it really does kind of keep keep the pilot the way it should be. Uh, and then we used, a, as I mentioned, a, a couple of successive passive of passes of various hole openers to kind of increase the, the diameter of the bore. Um, this is your tip. This was the area shot of the setup in Cork Dockyard. So, um, so one thing to note here is the amount of space kind of required for drilling operations itself. It's not just the drilling rig, which is number one there in the picture, but you've got your um, your generating. Uh, um, plant on, on two and three there and the operating cabin, but also the recycling units and the mud mixers there on kind of 765, that kind of area, they take up a large profile. That's all the bentonites being pumped from, but also being returned to and all the cuttings have been shaken out um, and then they can go to landfill because they're kind of inert. So a big operation. You also, what you see there on the ground number nine is a, a big long kind of uh, drill rod being assembled. Um, so you, you kind of you need a lot of space to get trucks in and out to assemble these rods. So yeah, it's a big operation. Um, not so bad on the launch site with the big wide dockyard, but over in Monkstown, you can see it's it's actually quite a quite a tight space. So we had to do a lot of work um, and putting in that bridge there to actually get into site as well. Not not the same amount of plant. We still have the recycling unit for once the um, once the pilot is through. The, the, we, there's no way of getting the bentonite back to the dockyard, so you're, you're recycling it from one end and pumping it back from, from, from both ends, really. Um, so we had our ideal profile of how the drill was going to go under the harbour. We had an idea of where it would come up. There's still a margin of error. So the red mark there in the picture between the cones, that's where the drill was supposed to come out. Uh, as you can see from the picture between the two cones, that's where it actually came out. So that's not a bad margin of error, error over a distance of roughly 1.1 kilometers for the drill. Um, and we did that twice. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly good. And that's kind of down to the operators and also the tools they're using, the kind of the laser gyroscopes as well. Just here's a couple of pictures. That's the that's a brand new hole opener there. That's the, the reaming tool, which increases the diameter of the bore once the pilot's done. That's the brand new one going in, about to go in, and that's it after one pass there on the right. You can see it's quite worn. That's tungsten carbide teeter just gone from it. That's kind of um, just kind of testament to how hard the rock is under the harbour in certain areas. So we replaced all those teeth three times in total for the for the project. But, uh, you know, that, that's all planned and expected for that type of rock. Uh, it's just a, a, another snapshot there of the hole opener about to go in um, to increase the pilot. 
Uh, that brings us on then to the actual pipe itself and the welding. So it's um it's a HDP pipe. It came in roughly 13 meter lengths. Uh, for it, it's going to be uh, fusion but welded together for a total length of 1.1 kilometers. It's a 55 mil wall in the pipe SDR9. So it's quite a it's quite a heavy pipe, quite a hard one to move as well. So. Um, we have this welding shed, kind of environmentally controlled welding shed uh, that was a butt, doing the butt fusion welding, a lot of non-destructive testing and also uh, destructive testing of sample wells done in that kind of every day. Um, what you don't see in the picture is that pipe is extending for 1.1 kilometers into a farmer's field at the top of a hill, but it's also a kilometer and a half away from where we want the pipe to be. Um, so we have to pull this pipe when it's fully assembled a total of 80 ton. We're going to pull that pipe from a farmer's field, bring it down to the um, exit site in Monkstown and pull it through the pilot hole using the drilling rig, which is based over in the Cork dockyard on the other side of the pilot bore. Uh, just to show you a snapshot here on the map. So that, that yellow line, that's the actual assembled pipe, roughly where it went. The pink line, that's the travel route that we have to bring the pipe down on a public road. Uh, a built up public road that's pr pretty much where most of the Monkstown population lives out just off that road and the red lines then is the final resting place for the pipe so we had to do that twice once for each pipe it took roughly a 24-hour operation closing the road you're bringing the pipe down on uh, cradles till it gets down to the uh, exit of the pit you can see the pipe coming down the road there um, it's on specialist cradles, specialist rollers with pipe pushing machines brought in just to control the descent of this pipe because it is 80 ton. It's coming down a steep hill in the Glen Road. Um, probably one of the bigger risks for the public on this project was um, getting this one wrong, bringing 80 ton of pipe, which does have the um, capability to freewheel. Uh, if that got loose, if it jumped the cradle, if it, if it went out of control, that would take down a house uh, quite easily. Um, you, you know, worst case scenario. By the time we actually got that connected to the drilling rig and started pulling it through, we actually found there was very little effort required to pull that pipe to gravity, gravity and the weight of it was taken down with the steep hill. It went through quite smoothly. Um, that's the finished profile. So we did it twice, uh, one for redundancy, why we went to this location and what we expected there later on his slides. But it, two of the biggest horizontal directional drills successfully undertaken in Ireland. And, you know, it did become uh, an, an award-winning drill in itself. So, so it, not, noticed by the Pipeline Industry Guild and the UK Society of Princess Technology, it was award-winning this year. Um, hopefully there'll be a few more awards to come um, after that. So again, that's the Whistle Stop Tour. It's available on YouTube. I'll just hand you back to Dave Lawn there now who'll introduce the next speakers. Thanks, Paul. Much appreciated. Um, I'm going to hand over to Martin shortly, but just to let people know, we were delighted to, to win the um, the Industry Guild Pipeline Award. I, I told my wife it was the pipeline equivalent of a BAFTA, but she's, she's not buying it. Um, Suffice it to say that uh, Martin is going to give a bit of background to the drill in terms of how we got to build it, where we built it. And um, I know Phylum is going to give you some detail on one or two of the many challenges that Cove presented. And while on the subject of awards, bear in mind that the, the works that, that Phylum are, is outlining took place while Cove was being assessed and won last week uh, the Tidy Ireland's largest Tidy Town Award. So Martin, if you're uh, ready to go, I'll, I'll let you make a, a start. Uh, thanks very much, Dave Lawn. Uh, cheers for that. So as Dave Lawn mentioned there, my name is Martin Hickey. I'm a, a senior project engineer with Nick And um, I've been involved as a design engineer on the project since 2015. And uh, I've been lucky or unlucky enough to be involved in, in nearly all stages of delivery of this team from, from the initial designs right through to the to construction stage. So myself and my colleague Fyla Moneil are going to present some of the, the key challenges and design decisions involved in delivering the project. Um, our part of the presentation will focus on the networks on the north side of the estuary, so those in, in Cove, as well as, as touching on the, the estuary crossing pipelines that, that, that Paul already introduced. Sorry, so just looking um, 
NOD were originally appointed in 2013 by Cork County Council to deliver the scheme. Um, our contracting was subsequently transferred to Irish Water in 2014, following the establishment of that organisation. Um, our scope services for delivery of the, the scheme can be broken into uh, six main stages, and then I suppose these six stages are also going to mirror the, the stages of the project itself. Um, given the scale of the project, it wouldn't be possible for us to talk through each of the six stages uh, for the overall scheme. So what we're going to do instead is we're just going to zoom in on a couple of locations and, and discuss those individual stages with a focus on, on those areas. So for the S3 crossing and the dockyard pump station, we're going to discuss those in terms of the initial design review, uh, the permitting and the consent requirements, and some of the, the design decisions as well around that. And then the reason we wanted to discuss those elements, just to give you a bit of an, an understanding of the history and some of the initial design decisions that, that were proposed, which I suppose ultimately resulted in the successful delivery of the S3 crossing pipelines that Paul was discussing earlier on. And then for the uh, preparation of the contract documents, um, the procurement of the, the various contracts and the contract administration, construction management and supervision, we're going to have a look at the, the old town hall pumping station and the town centre works where we highlight some of the key risks and challenges associated with undertaking these heavy civil works in, in an urban environment. Um, for that section, the main focus will be on the construction management and, and the supervision, which uh, which Fylan will, will discuss. So just a, a bit of a, a brief recap on, on what Paul was discussing earlier on in terms of what was involved in the estuary crossing to dockyard pump station. So the estuary crossing is, is a, a twin 500 mil pipe crossing underneath the estuary with each uh, drive being over a kilometre length. And then the dockyard pump station is, the, is a terminal pumping station in Gold, which makes it the, the final pump station on the island itself. It's also the, the final piece of infrastructure upstream from the estuary crossing and pipelines. Um, it's quite a, a complex pumping station. It, it wouldn't be your, your standard um, Irish water, standard spec pump station with plenty of ancillary elements, which I'll, I'll go through in a bit more detail uh, later on. So just having a quick look at the, the initial design review. So the initial design uh, would have been completed in early to mid 2000s. And um, so then by the time Nick Sadoir became involved, there have been significant changes in terms of available technology and in terms of actual stakeholder requirements. And um, during the design review stage, we identified a number of potential design refinements. And um, these, these proposals improved efficiencies, reduced environmental impacts, and also resulted in a reduction in the capex costings. So I'm just going to give a, 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 a high level overview of some of the design refinements identified for this location. So what we have is the original design was sending flows to the north of the, what was carried below pump station, pumped underneath the estuary, which was to be installed by, by dredging, and then south to the Monkstown pump station. But what we identified was the skew bridge here, which is located on the R624 with the railway running under it. So there was a number of new Irish rail requirements which meant that the clearances between the, any, uh, any infrastructure and their, their infrastructure was, was, was increased, which meant that the, the depths had to be increased along the R624, which would have led to long-term closures, which would add uh, impacts on the community. There's also the cut and cover tunnel located on the, the Monkstown side, which is an 18th century tunnel. Um, SI that was undertaken informed that the rocket is at the surface at that point. So, Trying to install a, a 1050 gravity sewer through there would have been a, quite a, a tricky piece of work. So the concept design that we came up with instead was instead of sending flows to the north and out um, beyond the ski bridge was to bring everything towards to, to kind of the dockyard pump station site, cross directly into Monkstown and then from there to the Monkstown pump station, which conveys flows from there up to the actual the treatment plant in Shan Valley that the Glan mentioned earlier on. So then just following on from the, um, the initial design refinement, it was determined that like the, the, the skew bridge was taken as a, as a boundary point for where we could go with our gravity sewers. So what we needed to do at this point then was to carry out a detailed site selection in order to identify an appropriate location for the pumping station site. We also had to carry out some detailed analysis to determine the best available technology to carry out the crossing. And then what we finally had to do was determine where the launch and the reception site uh, should be located. So this was uh, a three-stage process which was carried out to inform each of the key design decisions. And this process involved a preliminary screening, 
So this uh, allowed us to screen out areas that just, just weren't suitable based on them being residential or commercial areas or, or public community areas. Um, and then following off from that, there was a, a technical evaluation. So this just evolved the preliminary screening and, and considered key issues such as available land areas, access and constructability. And then finally, we carried out um, a detailed multi-criteria analysis using a, an analytical hierarchy process. So that process focused in a, a, and considered uh, certain criteria such as planning, environmental issues, human and cost issues, and, and technical and cost. So just having a look so at the pumping station site. So what we have is just a, a kind of a, a screening map that we have here. So the blue areas are basically potential sites that, that proceeded through uh, stages one and two, which were potential options for the, 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 the estuary crossing uh, location and the, uh, the launch site. And then on the other side, we have the potential reception sites, which also had to take into consider the, the pipe staging areas and, and the stringing areas as well. And then in terms of the estuary crossing construction technology, there was, there was a few pieces on the table in the, the initial de de the decisions. So the first being to continue on with a, a dredge solution. So that would have been screened out early enough, just given the how environmental impacts that could have on the, the SACs and the SBAs in the actual estuary itself or in Cork Harbour. Then there was also a tunnel boring was also considered as a, as a potential option. So I suppose as you, as you probably are aware, the, the estuary itself is quite deep. So for a TVM solution to be um, realized there, we would have needed extremely deep drive and reception uh, shafts. So they would have been over 40 or 50 meters in depth. So just the, the, the cost associated with them meant that it just wasn't a feasible solution. So that's how we ended up going with the, the horizontal directional drilling was was um, was proceeded onto the next phase of the design. So then, just in terms of the actual the permitting and the consents, um, the original planning application for the project was was approved in 2009 by on board Panola. But then, based on the, the refined design approach, uh, an application to the board to amend the grant planning, planning permission was required. Um, as the original application was deemed a strategic infrastructure application, the amendment process was undertaken uh, under section 146B of the Planning and Development Act. And um, that site selection that I was discussing in the previous slide, that, that formed an integral part of the submission to the board for the, for the alteration request. And um, I suppose it is worth noting that what we presented this evening is just one aspect was involved in the, in the amendment to the application process. Well, reality, this was just a, a single piece of the overall, much more complex application, which involved separate amendment applications for, for the north side of the estuary and for the south of the estuary. And um, just in terms of as part of the consent process, uh, one of the, the key items as well that the client are keen to uh, adhere to is making sure that the community were kept on board throughout. So what we have here is just a, a planning drawing showing a sectional view through the actual dockyard pumping station. So what you'll notice is that the majority of the pumping station is actually located below ground. This was largely done in order to protect the, the views from these houses in, in Pebble Beach here, which is a, a residential area. So the majority of the pumping station is actually located below ground and it's also an earth embankment, uh, a screening bond basically uh, erected right around it. So, so if we go on to the next slide, you'll see this is the view from the actual foreshore looking towards the pump station, which is just hidden in here behind the, um, the bun there itself. Um, during the actual construction phase, Irish Water actually appointed a new um, biodiversity officer. So he actually got involved in the project and proposed a, a, a wildflower seed mix. So that's being planted by the contractor. So hopefully next summer, uh, this picture will look a bit brighter than it currently does in this uh, drab wintry photo we have there. And um, there would also be multiple other forms of consent required as part of the project, such as section 50 applications for, for the access that Paul was discussing to the, um, the park in, uh, in Monkstone for, the, um, for the, the, the drill reception site. And then there's also foreshore license applications required for construction of the combined sewer outflows pause and for the, um, the removal of the existing outflows from the foreshore too. So then just moving on to have a look at some of the more detailed design associated with the estuary crossing and the dockyard pump station. So one of the major complexities that Paul touched on in his presentation was around uh, associated with the HDD would be in relation to the geotechnical conditions in the estuary. 
So in collaboration with Irish Water, an extensive suite of site investigations was undertaken to inform the design. And the SOE included multiple boreholes and rotary corridors along the route of the crossing, as well as geophysical and GPR surveys, which, which supplemented that. So we just have an image here of one of the jack up barges that was uh, mobilized to undertake the SI. It was a uh, priority, I think, who were carrying out the works that time. So look, the, the geology in Cork Harbour is, is quite complex and it's, it's characterized by a number of fault lines, uh, which can be seen in the, just the attached image here. So what we have is the dockyard site is located here on the east of the image. You've got Monkstone on the, on the left-hand side. These little blue dots are the um, boreholes and water cores that we took along the route. And then these red lines are, uh, are potential fault lines that are uh, that were identified in, in the rock strata. Um, the fault lines basically represent weaknesses in the rock profile and are routes where the, the drill mud could potentially be lost, which in turn would have resulted in pressure losses in the actual the, 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 the core itself, uh, which could have released uh, which could have increased the risk of, of bore collapse and also could have resulted in environmental issues. So to assist us in better understanding the geology, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Ivor McCarthy, who's a, a senior lecturer in the Department of Geology in UCC. So then that collaboration, coupled with the extensive site investigation surveys, enabled us to develop a, a clearer understanding of the geology in the area. So that enhanced understanding allowed us to develop a design which we had confidence with would, would mitigate against the risks associated with the, the fractured rock in the area. So one of the measures that we proposed would have been to actually drill a, a quite deep depths into the bedrock to, to mitigate against those risks. So that's one of the, the main factors in, in why the, the actual the drill itself is, is 50 or 60 meters below data. We also collaborated with um, technical experts in the field of, of trenches construction. So we collaborated with, with Borges Limited to develop a, a detailed feasibility study, which considered the, the viability of delivering the estuary crossing by horizontal direction of drilling. The study considered uh, achievable drive lengths and the particular constraints associated with our project. Um, so we confirmed that the that the that the drive was was was, was feasible, and it also assisted us in identifying specific constraints, including the contract documents uh, for the contract that we prepared as part of the estuary crossing project. So just what we have here are just uh, some of the contract drawings that were issued uh, for the for the estuary crossing project as part of the NEC uh, three. Which Paul was discussing. So we have uh, the design corridor shown here in the, this yellow area. So the design corridor was uh, in both the, the horizontal and the vertical plane. So the horizontal plane basically makes sure that the, the pipeline stays under the correct alignment and keeps it within the, the whaleys that we've acquired through some of the private lands and on either side of the actual estuary. And then the vertical, uh, the vertical design corridor makes uh, ensure that the, the contractor could not proceed with, with, a, with, a, with a proposal which was for a shallower crossing, which may have been at a, a higher risk strategy, which, which we and our client wanted to, to avoid. So then just moving on to actually look at the dockyard itself, I suppose from, from Paul's discussion and from what I've just gone through there, so to get a flavor for the complexities associated with delivering the actual estuary crossing pipelines. So there was great care taken in terms of creating a design to ensure that the pipelines were protected and there was a, so in order to achieve that, the dockyard pumping station itself is actually designed with a, with a full inlet works. So there's fine screens that are shown here on the, on the specimen design drawing, um, which basically just prevent detritus material from entering the wet well before it could even get to the actual um, the pump stations and the estuary crossing themselves. So this is just a, an image of the fine screens post construction. There's also a grit trap included to intercept any grits and sands, as well as any fat soils and greases. So this is just a, an image of the, the grid trap being constructed. And then this is just a, the post-construction photo of the, of, of the grid trap itself. We also included for ice picking, which is basically just introducing a, a slushy ice compound into the actual the, the, the pipelines themselves. This then is just flushed through the network and cleans out any materials that have potentially got past the actual fine screens or, or the grid chamber. So we allowed for, for ice picking to take place on, on either side of the uh, of the estuary. So you can see here, it's just a, a connection to, to the rising end. So what we're looking at basically is we've got our, our four main pumps in the docker pump station, our manifold, and then the twin pipes heading off there out of the actual pump station. And so the, uh, this connection from here where the discussion can be there can be added directly into the actual rising end. This goes to the chamber above ground, 
which is a borrow connection that a, a truck can just connect into and discharge the ice straight into it. And then I suppose one of the main items as well would be this, this twin pipe solution, which Paul touched on earlier. So the twin pipe solution would have been something that would have been subject to quite detailed review with time. It was obviously a, an expensive or it's costly proposal to go with that. So it was subjugated, subjected to, um, to a detailed review. And uh, it was determined that the, the twin pipe solution was, was the, the optimal design here, mainly for, for a couple of reasons. There was, it increases your operational uh, flexibility in terms of operating the pipelines. So by having the, the twin pipes were able to operate at uh, minimum design velocities, for greater periods of the day for, for each rising lane. And then the other major advantage to having the, the twin pipe solution is that I suppose Cove itself is, is, is an island and the S3 crossing pipelines are, are quite complex. So if there was ever any reason why one of those um, pipelines was knocked out of commission, there's the risk that the island would have been cut off completely from downstream network. So to avoid this, the twin pipe solution was, was developed. Uh, each of those pipelines is able to take 75% of the formula flow. Uh, formula flow on, for, in this catchment, it, it's, it's roughly around eight or nine times your dry weather flow. So what that basically means is that even if one of the pipes is down, that the, um, the network will still operate fairly effectively for nearly all uh, flow conditions. So this is just a, an image there of the, the, the twin pipelines uh, coming out from the actual the pump station during the construction phase. And then this is where they interface with the contract C or the estuary crossing pipeline before they, they dive down deep underneath the estuary. So then just, just moving on to the actual old town hall itself. So this is just a, an area view of the town center in, in Cove. Um, so we've got the, the old town hall um, itself here. We construct a, a pump station and then some pipelines. So just to I give a, a bit of an overview of what was involved in this area. So we've got our, our pump station in this site here, which included a, an ESB substation as well as a, a storm tank. There's a 750 gravity sewer coming in from the east, and then there's a, a 1050 gravity sewer coming from the, the west, as well as a 400 mil rising and heading in the opposite direction. There's also a 900 mil uh, CSO pipe that was constructed through the existing uh, key wall. So the contract for coal was delivered using the major works civil engineering contract. Uh, it was a design build approach. So one of the core objectives of our client was to ensure that there was a high level of risk control throughout the project from both a health and safety and a financial perspective. There were multiple risk areas identified associated with the works for, for the Autumn Hall and Town Centre. So a couple of these risk areas would have been the existing structures, as you're aware, coal would be a, quite a historic town. So the, the buildings themselves are, are on fairly old and they're, they're quite close to where the works had to take place. The topography of the town as well was, was another challenge that we had to try and overcome as illustrated here by this photo. You can see that the town itself is built tier upon tier and it's all falling down towards the, the, the estuary which is just located down here. The, and the proximity to the foreshore and the influence that the tidal waters had was, was another risk and then there was the usual risk you'd have in, in constructions in a, an urban environment such as the existing utilities and the public interface. So I'll just give a high level overview of some of the risk control measures that we built into the contract. And then my colleague Philo O'Neill will go into a bit more detail on these measures and how they were implemented during the administration of the contract. Um, the measures included an extremely detailed scope of work and specimen design, which, which ensured that the risks associated with the project were appropriately communicated to the bidders, as well as detailing mitigation measures, which, which minimized the risks. We also included key performance indicators or KPIs and, and milestone payments in the contract. Uh, the KPIs covered items such as safety, community, quality, environment, and also included items in terms of the coordination with other uh, corporate harbor contracts. And we also included um, exceptional adjustment events, uh, which gave us a bit more financial certainty for certain risks areas, which could not be fully quantified prior to the contract beginning. So a few examples of those areas have been around, say, unforeseen archaeological discoveries or flood events or, or unforeseen delays. So then just have a, a little bit more uh, of a look at some of these in, in detail. So just looking at the existing structures and, and the topography. So as I mentioned there, the town is built on tiers with, with multiple levels dependent on the, the structural integrity. Uh, uh, so the town is built on tiers with, with the lower levels uh, dependent on the structure integrity of, of the, 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 the lower levels. 
So in, in the preparation of the contract docs, we were acutely aware of including a requirement that, that all structures in the town were protected and monitored and uh, not just those in close proximity to the works. That's where the, the design corridor, the zone of influence and uh, the design envelope came into play, which followed will go into a bit more detail. There was also extremely strict monitoring requirements uh, set out in, in, the, in the scope of works. Again, Fire will go through that in a bit further. In terms of the existing utilities, again, there was extensive SI undertaken in advance of the contracts being awarded. There was well over 100 split trenches carried out in the town of Cove. This allowed us to um, prepare extremely detailed specimen designs, calling up individual crossings along the way. So for the project, there was, uh, I think it was in excess of 300 crossings with very few clashes along the way. And then in terms of the public interface, again, this is one of the key items that our client were, were keen to, 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 to focus in on. So there have been community KPIs included, uh, which would have allowed us to, to penalise the contractor if there was any issues in terms of uh, complaints or uh, not responding to complaints uh, in, in, soon enough. Like in fairness, that, that didn't actually have to be in, uh, implemented throughout the contract because the, the JV we had on the project were, were extremely uh, competent in terms of the community engagement and were, had, the, um, had the locals on board throughout the project. This is largely down to the fact that there was a, a local liaison officer appointed for the full duration of the project who did Trojan work right throughout. And there was also the public meetings that, that, that were discussed previously and then the general Irish water communications as well. And then finally, just moving on to the procurement phase. Uh, the procurement procedure followed the same principle in terms of risk control uh, as discussed earlier. <coughs> we want to ensure that the prospective bidders were fully aware of the key challenges and risks associated with this complex project and just wanted to ensure that they priced the project appropriately. And to achieve this, uh, a design tender process was implemented. We also went with a 60 quality, 40 price split in terms of the, the award process. It was a negotiated procedure which allowed the client to engage with the prospective bidders throughout the process. And then a key one as well is that the proposals formed part of the contract. So whichever or whoever was a successful bidder, whatever they included as part of their tender, those items became contractual. So in, in order to get, to get the benefit of this, we included tailored ITT questions. So we required the contract to provide detailed methodology in terms of how they're going to deliver the works in accordance with the scope of works in some of the, the key locations. One of those being the town center itself and the delivery of the S3 or the, the old town hall pump station. Um, I'll now pass you over to Phylum, who's going to go through some of the, um, the, the contract administration works and go through some of the actual, the, the actual the more interesting parts in terms of actually showing the uh, scheme being built. Uh, thanks very much Martin. Uh, good evening everyone and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I'll, I'll try not to keep it too much long. I'm kind of conscious of the we're, we're approaching the hour nearly. Uh, so uh, my name is Philem O'Neill and I was a senior resident engineer uh, across the Cork Low Harbour main drainage contracts um, including the Cove Networks. So following on from uh, Martin's overview of the design and engineering I'll take you through uh, the key infrastructure locations and how we constructed them. So as the slide shows uh, here, just to give a brief overview of the Cove networks, uh, this map illustrates the works that were installed as part of the new network, which would be transferred to the wastewater treatment plant in Chamberley. So overall, it consisted of four kilometers of new gravity sewers, three and a half kilometers of new rising mains, five new pumping stations, uh, new combined sewer overflows, and the most important thing, I suppose, is the decommissioning of 18 number existing outfalls that were discharging untreated effluent into Park Harbour um, in Cove, as outlined earlier in the presentation. So each area really brought its own challenges uh, with tight working conditions, such as uh, keeping the town centre open for business, uh, residential areas where we were working in around uh, foreshore works, and of course, existing utilities and services, just, just to name the top four there. Um, so this photo uh, shown demonstrates an example of one of the areas which truly illustrates uh, some of the tight working areas available with the railway to the north, you had the playground to the south and the works immediately on the foreshore. So at this particular location, we installed a new pumping station, a rising main and a gravity main. Whilst each location and new infrastructure was installed brought their own challenges, the town centre really carried the highest risk due to the nature of the location and complex works required, including very tight working corridor and particular challenges. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, as outlined by Martin previously, the old town hall pump station and associated gravity and rising mains were finalised following an extensive consultation phase with the public and planning proceedings. We, we really paid particular uh, emphasis in the contract on how the construction of the works must take consideration of the surrounding areas and constraints of working in a busy town centre. So as shown, as, as detailed by Martin earlier, you can see the outline here of the new pumping station and associated gravity mains and rising mains that were to be constructed. So while you can see the locations are in the town centre, it only becomes really apparent when you highlight all the challenges we faced, such as uh, the extent of properties to be monitored and protected during the works. Some of these buildings were of historical significance and protected. Uh, the existing key wall and jetty, which is in disrepair and inaccessible. Uh, Two-way traffic to be maintained during all construction works for residents living to the west of the new pump station, as, as this was the only access way in and out for over 100 homes. Um, as an example of the working room left for the pump station itself, I've highlighted this area in orange. So this marked up sketch alone demonstrates from a visual perspective the extreme challenges faced in this area alone and I'll detail how we overcame these challenges successfully and safely. So the photo shown is the existing old town hall building and clock tower that is located to the immediate west of the new pumping station. Uh, the building and clock tower itself was built in the 1800s. And as you can see in the photo was, and very much still is visibly in disrepair and showing visible signs of structural distress. So given that the new pump station is to be constructed underground, it was a requirement for the successful tender to provide all temporary and permanent works necessary to safely construct the pump station and pipelines without damaging the integrity of the clock tower, uh, the key wall and all adjoining structures. So it wasn't just the old uh, town hall clock tower, which was, which was of concern. As you can see from the photo, existing buildings in the town centre were also showing signs of disrepair. At the front of the building shown in the photo, a uh, 1,050 millimeter new gravity main was to be installed four and a half meters deep in the center of the road, which are in close proximity to the old town hall also. Also included in this trench would be the new 400 mil rising main connecting the new pumping station at old town hall and ultimately transferring flows to the dockyard pumping station. So notwithstanding the new major infrastructure installed, we also took into consideration the existing services in the road, which resulted in ultimately less space and working room once excavations commenced. So just to, to ensure the protection, uh, integrity and stability really of all the structures in the area, we included specific requirements within the scope of works to protect the workers, uh, the public, uh, property owners and, and the client also. Uh, these included pre and post construction surveys of all relevant structures and properties across the project. Uh, the, these surveys would identify all properties really that required monitoring throughout the project contract and ultimately the contractor prepared uh, an instrumentation and monitoring plan based on, on these reports. So this along with the structural reports was to be shared then ultimately with the temporary works designer for the contractor, which was also a requirement to have full time in place. I've actually included there a photo of the 1050 gravity main being constructed through the town centre, just, just to give an indication of the size of the excavations, which may make sense to the extent of the precautions we, we, had, to be take, we had to take in the town. Uh, the zone of influence also took into consideration um, subsoil, groundwater, tidal influence, and how changes in geological and hydrological conditions really would impact the works. So ultimately, the streets and cove rise tier above tier, as, as Martin alluded to earlier. So really due to the steep nature of the hill along the shorefront, we highlighted that the zone of influence may extend more properties immediately adjacent to works and, and outside the south boundary, really. Um, so this photo shows some of the monitoring equipment we installed in the project, uh, including uh, um, position targets, telltales, tilt monitors, and electronic real-time recordings, which were also linked to the phones of the foreman and engineers on site. So if any movement was detected, uh, all works would stop immediately. We also had a really good proactive design workshops with, with the contractor and the contractor's designers uh, to ensure all any both were being captured in all the designs. So given the extent of surveying and investigation works we completed, um, we, we included provisions for the contractor for that any temporary works may be required to potentially support um, uh, or propping prior to any commencement of the construction works. 
So even with all the above, there, unfortunately, there was one building identified in the town centre, which continued to deteriorate rapidly as an example uh, since the commencement of the project. So the extent of accelerated deterioration on this building in particular resulted in the local authority erecting a dangerous buildings notice on the building of, during the works. So it's following collaborative design reviews and again following all the plans and procedures we had in place, um, a temporary works design was completed, which involved a protective frame in front of the building. Uh, the one thing that was important to note that this frame was to protect the workers and the public from any potential collapse to the facade, not to prop up the building itself. So to install the new mains, uh, vast temporary works and shoring was required in the trench, given that a depth of an excess of five metres had to be excavated. As can be seen in the bottom left of the photo, we, we ensured the contractor had an engineer monitoring the buildings consistently during the works with a total station, as well as all motor monitoring remaining in place, uh, as I referenced earlier. So this photo kind of captures the close proximity again to the buildings in the area and protection measures installed to ensure the works were completed safely. You can, you can see in the photo there the depths that we had to be excavated and limited space that was available to install the new pipe work. So this also, this also ensured safe access for, for everyone else, engineers, technicians, uh, completing all testing, as building, testing of the mains, etc. So, so this really was successfully achieved throughout the, the works with and, and really kind of in enforcing the positive safety culture across the project. Uh, even when the works were completed, um, monitoring the buildings, they still continued on, even once the works were a certain distance away, just to uh, account for any potential settlement upon completion. So thankfully, all works were completed safely, on time, and with co cooperation of the businesses and residents in the area. So to move on to a more, interest, more interesting side of things, the, the Old Town Hall pumping station. So this location was finalised following an extensive planning and consultation phase with the public. However, this location really did bring its own challenges. The area is really subject to the very high groundwater and extreme tidal variations, which over time has resulted in the deterioration of the ground conditions in the area, which can be seen in the photo. So in the time we were preparing the contract documents, we found that the existing surface was showing signs of settlement. Notable depressions in the surface of the site had formed during the planning period of this project, and we highlighted in the contract documents this to ensure that both the tenderers were both aware of this, and ultimately that it was included these constraints in their temporary and permanent works designs. As you can see, these existing gaps in the key wall was resulting in migrations of fines due to tidal influence, which was forming voids underneath the existing slab. So when completing the specification and contract documents for the works, we included several options of construction methodology for the pump station, which would mitigate damage to the existing property and would reduce the watering requirements of which the contractor would provide the full design package for. So one of the options included by us was the use of seeking piling, which was actually what was progressed with the contractor. The design for the pumping station to be completed by the the contractor had to take into consideration also uh, the following, which demonstrated the challenges we faced. Um, protection of the existing key wall, including load limits adjacent to the wall. Uh, there was also protective structure to be protective structures, apologies, to be maintained, including mooring bollards. Uh, protection of existing structure, including the existing old town hall clock tower, which dates back to the 1800s, as I was uh, demonstrating earlier, and has visible signs of st structural distress. There was a number of existing services running through the site, ESB, telecom, and also a live substation kiosk to the left of the photo, which had to be protected during the course of the works as it was still live. Noise and vibration stations were set up around the site also. So not only were we monitoring the vibrations of the works, but also the noise levels could not be exceeded either, given that the, this was a residential area uh, living and people were literally living across the road from the works. So this is an overview, elevation and plan of the pumping station that we installed. So as you can see from the drawings, the, the wet well in particular uh, with the pumps was eight metres below ground level and the storm tank seven metres below ground level. Um, this section further illustrates the complexities we face in constructing the pumping station when you factor in the protection of the existing buildings to the left and on the right of it, ensuring the tidal influence was managed throughout the whole works. So, so this really was a complex design to overcome, um, 
basically this section ultimately gives you a, a vast indication of how deep we had to go to, to, to not only build to, for the finished surface, but to build it itself. So before any works could commence on the structure itself, the damaged section of the key wall had to be repaired, which included st firstly stabilizing the ground and secondly repairing sections of the key wall that had collapsed previously. So this alone was a very high, high risk task given proximity to the foreshore and required detailed designs and construction methodologies to ensure it was completed safely. Um, once the key wall was repaired and the ground area was stabilized, uh, works on preparing the hard sand area for the piling rig to be set up. So the piling rig required was a 120 ton rig in which a platform had to be constructed to ensure that it was safe, level, and basically support the ground conditions that the machine will exert. So it was ultimately to ensure that no excessive, excessive loads were exerted on the key wall. So once the piling platform was works were completed, we were able to commence some piles themselves. So a total of 114 piles were installed, uh, 57 hard piles and 57 soft piles, which were 750 millimeter in diameter each. Uh, the auger depth was approximately 12 meter, uh, 12 meters until suitable penetration into the rock was achieved as per the design requirements. So the approach taken was that the soft piles were unreinforced piles of 1.3 meter centers using a P280 soft concrete mix and then installed the interlocking hard piles using C3037 concrete with a full length uh, reinforcement cage inserted. Uh, once the piling rig, uh, once piling was completed, capping beam was constructed to seal the entire piling perimeter. So once obviously sufficient curing time was allowed, the bulk excavations commenced. As can be seen in the photo, a permanent rail barrier was also set up along the top of the capping beam, including providing a safe working area to ensure all hazardous areas were restricted. So once the first target depth was reached, the temporary works wader frame and propping system was installed. So this was in included as part of the overall temporary works for the construction of the, the structure to support piles during the bulk excavations prior to construction of the pump station walls. So this photo internally within the Seekin piles, once completed, uh, demonstrates the depth at which these works were completed at. So works were actually now able to safely commence on preparing the base slab safely. As outlined earlier, the Seekin piling really mitigated damage to the existing properties in the area and drastically reduced the dewatering requirements during construction. Uh, here is a few photos during the construction of the reinforcement structure, which would take up uh, all of this presentation if I had to go through every phase of it. But uh, these photos do, however, capture the extremely tight working space available and how these challenges were overcome. Uh, before the roof went on, uh, on, before the roof went on, the photo on the left demonstrates, demonstrates the size of the pump station with the wet well shown and the storm storage tank. So precast concrete slabs were installed, which also had to take allowance for the large openings required for future access and maintenance. So once the structure itself was substantially completed and waterproof, we were able to proceed with the mechanical and electrical works. All pumps, overflow screens, tanks, valve chambers were installed and tested and tested ahead of completing all mechanical and electrical works, ultimately to tie into the new MCC room built adjacent to the substation at the east end of the site. So the pump station basically site was able to be closed up and then it actually relatively happened very quickly then once, um, once all the main works were in place. As you can see, the ground fully backfilled and ready for final reinstatement. So the pump station was itself was successfully commissioned in the summer of this year, which transferred all flows from Central and East Cove to the Dockyard Pumping Station. The photo shown is the completed area at the Old Town Hall Pumping Station. As can be seen, all the temporary works, they were removed, the pump station completed, new substation constructed, ground stabilized and resurfaced. And the most positive of all, the old clock, the old town hall and clock tower are still there, thankfully. So um, as a team, we, we overcame many challenges, including a global pandemic, which involved innovative engineering, design coordination, community engagement, environmental protection and the, and the execution of varying construction procedures, whilst at the same time maintaining the highest level of health and safety standards. It was a great success to all involved. Um, while it was a team effort over the entire duration of the project, 
I, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge Shane Cosgrove, who was the former project manager on the Cork Low Harbour Main Drainage Project, who, who oversaw all five contracts on the project. Shane only recently left Nix O'Dwyer, but was involved from the very beginning of this project and was a key figure in the overall delivery of this huge infrastructure project. On that note, uh, thank you for your time this evening, and I hope you all found the presentation interesting. I'll pass you back to Dave Law and there for a few closing comments before we open up the floor to any questions on the project. Thank you. Thanks, Phylum. Much appreciated. Um, thanks for um, your kind words to Shane. Yeah, I'd reiterate the same. And I'd also like to thank our contractors, uh, O'Connor Utilities and Farn Sorensons, um, for the crossing in Cove. In, in, it was no mean feat to get the works done on time safely. Um, very much appreciated. Look, you highlighted a couple of the challenges. It's the tip of the iceberg. There was 101 challenges along the way on this project, but hopefully you've got a flavour for what the job involved. The completion of the works is a, a significant milestone for Irish Waters uh, endeavours to, to eliminate the discharge of raw sewage along Ireland's coastline. It means 20,000 homes and businesses are now connected to the scheme. Uh, the towns of Crosshaven, Carrigaline, um, uh, Passage, Monkstown, Ringiskiddy, uh, they're all now discharging into Shan Valley for treatment rather than uh, having 40,000 wheelie bins going out raw. It's now treated before it's discharged. And it's no doubt that the, the work will support economic growth and development in the area, certainly, and look forward to the potential for tourism and recreational activities and just enhancing the, the fantastic amenity that is the lower harbour. So thank you for your time. Without further ado, I'll hand back to Valerie and Michal. Thank you.